Hi y'all, today I am going to be reviewing American Pastoral by Philip Roth. So one of my book friends recommended The Human Stain by Philip Roth to me. He thought I'd enjoy it. I told him that I had just finished reading The Dying Animal by Philip Roth and had really enjoyed this uh, very much and he thought I would enjoy The Human Stain. And when I went to go look up The Human Stain by Philip Roth, I found it was actually part of a trilogy. It was a third book in a trilogy. And so I started with the first book, which is American Pastoral. Now since I first picked up the book, I learned through the magic of Goodreads that I didn't actually have to read the first two books in these trilogies. It's a loosely related trilogy and they're all standalone, so could have saved myself there. But I figure, you know, I read it, and it's one of those books that no one seems to be critical of. Um, at least not outside of, you know, Goodreads comments. So, here I am. So this is going to be a spoiler review. Um, mostly because there's no real plot. And it's kind of hard to talk about without giving spoilers. However, I will do as much as I can of the non-spoilery bits early and I will give you a timestamp uh, once I'm getting to the spoiler bits so that you can skip ahead if you don't want to hear the spoilery bits. I will try to go light on the spoilers and not delve too deep. This is not a literary analysis. The whole point of this review is to help you decide if you want to pick up the book. So American Pastoral was published in 1997 and won the Pulitzer in that year. So the the basic idea of the story um, is that this novelist named Zuckerman, who apparently has his own trilogy written by Roth that occurred before this, he was approached and asked to write the life story of a man called Seymour Lvov, henceforth known as the Swede. Zuckerman and the Swede went to high school together. Um, the Swede was kind of an all-American, he was an athlete, he was good-looking, he was he was popular, he was well-liked, he was everything that everyone wanted to be. That is set up as the structure of the story, however it is, I would say, purposefully ignored through most of the story and there are very large chunks where you forget that Zuckerman is writing this and you simply get involved and you think you're in the head of Seymour Lvov. Philip Roth writes in a meandering, stream of consciousness sort of writing. He does it very well. I like his writing. I do not have a problem with Philip Roth. But I am rapidly coming to the conclusion that while Philip Roth writes a damn good novella, he really doesn't write that good of a novel. Now the book is very literary, and on a literary level it does what it needs to do. It's exceptional writing as Roth has always achieved. But from a reading experience standpoint, from a storytelling standpoint, it misses badly and it's, it is not a very good reading experience. And I am not alone in this opinion. Go check out pretty much any other review and somewhere along the line they're going to say, this was tough to get through. It's not a book you pick up for entertainment. It's a book you pick up because it won a Pulitzer. So like I said, Zuckerman writing the Swede story is how the book is set up. However, that structure is intentionally set aside and ignored, so it does not bind the story together. It does not form a framework for the book. So from a storytelling standpoint, the only structure the novel really has is some character shadow play between the Swede and the Swede's daughter. Basically, the Swede, Lvov, he is a man who he thinks he's always trying to do the right thing but in reality he spends his entire life trying to not do the wrong thing and this ends up being very much the wrong thing and in the process he denies his own individuality and he denies his own agency within his own life so throughout the book we follow the Swede and we see the Swede continually trying to not do the wrong thing but he never acknowledges his own agency or his own individuality in that and he never seeks his own opinion on what the wrong thing is or on what the right thing is. His daughter Mary on the other hand continually tries to do the right thing 
but she puts too much stock in her own agency and her own individuality and fails to acknowledge the agency of those around her. She never learns to look outside her singular perspective or seek other opinions besides her own. While her father makes himself a spectator in life, Mary makes herself the judge, jury, and executioner of life. Like I said, the shadow methodology of characters is the only structure that holds the novel together. The Swede never figured out that he exists as an individual within a larger society. And Mary never figured out that there is a larger society that exists outside of herself as an individual. And if this review is rambling, it's because the book is too. So the Swede is the guy who is supposed to embody the American idea, the American dream. He's good looking, he's athletic, he's a business owner, everyone likes him, he's popular, and he's an all over pretty good guy. Now the Swede is a guy who never quite figured out that the people around him don't feel like they have everything together, even though it may look like they have everything together. This is a man who thinks that the models on magazine covers actually look like that and would be flabbergasted at the concept of Photoshop. I swear to God, if this book was not written in 1997, I would swear it was a social commentary on Instagram. Roth's writing, as usual, is top notch. This is a man who can spend a page writing about a bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich, and at the end of that page you can taste the bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich. And if you are at all interested about that, it's page 258. The book is written in a classic Philip Roth style, which is a rambling stream of consciousness. Roth does this very well, and there are moments when there is an internal monologue going on during an actual conversation, and it feels so real. It feels so real when that's happening, and Roth is truly a master at this type of narrative style. That being said, Roth can be exceptionally long-winded and can have a Morgenstein level of sarcasm about some things. So I'm going to get into some spoiler bits, as much as this can be called spoiler bits. This book didn't really have a plot, so take that for what you will. But go to this timestamp if you want to skip this bit. So we got to talk about the gloves. So the Swede has several options after he gets out of high school on what to do with his life. He wants to go um, pursue a academic scholarship that he was offered. But his father wants him to take over the family business, which is uh, very expensive gloves. Ladies' gloves, gentlemen's gloves. And oh my gosh, do we get to hear about gloves. I now know more about old school manufacturing of leather gloves than I ever cared to know about. Thank you, Philip Roth. You have enriched my knowledge base. Now, I said before that Roth has a Morgenstein style of sarcasm. And what I mean by that is... Morgenstein wrote The Princess Bride, and in order to have anyone read it, it had to be abridged because he just went on and on about stuff that wasn't part of the story um, in order to make a point about some political things that were going on. Roth has the same tendency. So the gloves are actually a commentary about outsourcing, which was a very real issue and concern in the 1990s. I was a teenager in the 1990s so I didn't care much but I do remember people talking about this and talking about it a lot and being very concerned about it uh, the idea of American manufacturing jobs going overseas losing this knowledge that is passed down from generation to generation that can't be learned in a book uh, Roth talks about uh, the leather cutters for the gloves the apprentice leather cutters had to stand there next to the actual leather cutters for two years before they were even allowed to have a pair of scissors in their hand. They had to learn how different leathers worked and how they stretched and oh my gosh, he goes on and on. People were worried about this sort of thing. They were worried about not being able to get quality products and they did not see a solution to it. They were worried about this. Now in 2019, this is really difficult to get excited about because if you want a pair of gloves that you can't afford, you can go on Etsy and find a pair of gloves that you cannot afford. And they are handmade and handcrafted and are all sorts of fancy. But sustainable small shops available on the internet was not something anyone was thinking about in 1997. So I've talked about the Swede's desire to never do the wrong thing versus trying to do the right thing 
and his complete lack of agency in his own life because of this, this overwhelming desire. This was highlighted best in one particular scene where the Swede is introducing his fiance to, um, his, to, to the Swede's father. His fiance, Dawn, uh, who eventually becomes his wife and the mother of Mary, she and the Swede's father get into an argument and get into a negotiation about how the Swede and Dawn's children will be raised, their future yet-to-be-conceived children. And the reason for this is the Swede comes from a Jewish family and Dawn came from a Christian family. Now, this is a really important conversation and should absolutely happen and should happen before the marriage, should happen before the children are born. How you're going to negotiate the religion aspect, particularly from families who are religious or at least from families where at least one of them is, re is particularly religious and how that's going to translate and how you're going to manage the obstacles that come about from this. This is a very important conversation to be had between the man and his wife not between the man's father and the man's wife. He sat there, dare I say impotently, while his father negotiated how his children would be raised with their future mother. So when I say the man lacks agency, I mean he lacks any possible form of agency in his own life. Compare and contrast that to Mary, the Swede's daughter, who becomes a domestic terrorist when she sets off a bomb because she's upset about something going on in the Korean War. You want to protest the war? Protest it right here in Old Rim Rock. What am I going to do, march around the post office? Bring the war home, isn't that the slogan? Look, they gave me this award. It's just a stupid plaque, but it means one thing. If you take a stand, people notice. If you oppose the war, right here, with all your strength, this is part of America too, you know. Read Marx. Revolutions don't begin in the countryside. We're not talking about revolution. You're not talking about revolution. The Swede spends a lot of time uh, thinking about Mary and about where he went wrong, if he went wrong, where other people went wrong when it came to Mary's upbringing and why she went off the deep end. Uh, after she set off the bomb, she ran away from home. He didn't hear from her for many years. A lot of the book follows his trying to find her. It's not a happy time. I will say though, the writing with the inner monologue on this section certainly struck a chord. Uh, as a parent, I have two children and the inner monologue of the Swede going back and forth and worrying about is it because he did this thing that screwed him up is because he didn't do the thing and it screwed him up uh, you're damned if you do you're damned if you're done with your kids you know if you never know how it's going to turn out you never know what effect is something's going to have and it could be little things it could be big things you know what school you send them to what you know did they eat enough peanut butter and jelly? Uh, anything. So the whole feeling of damned if you don't, damned if you do when parenting, uh, that, that resonated. I felt that. Towards the very end of the book, out of absolutely nowhere, we learn that the Swede's wife is having an affair with the neighbor and the Swede himself is having an affair with the same neighbor's wife. So we got a whole little neighborhood thing going on here. And it was interesting to me, not the affair itself, because I didn't care at this point. The Swede, his inner monologue, he spends so much time justifying his affair by saying he's gone through all of this uh, tragedy with his daughter. He's gone through all of this trauma, which he has. And it has led him to this affair and it really has nothing to do with any level of attraction or any sort of emotional connection with the neighbor just that he's taking comfort in her and this this whole thing that has absolutely nothing to do with her and it's all about you know his his trauma and dealing with all of that which is fine as an excuse you know I'm it's realistic enough honestly I, I didn't have a problem with that what I found interesting was when he discovered that his wife was also having an affair, 
there isn't a single line in his thoughts about what his wife has gone through and she's been right there and in fact has in many ways been dealt a worse blow emotionally she had to go into you know 24-hour therapy into like uh, what they called it into psychological evaluation she had a complete emotional breakdown this is after that but all he can think of is what does she see in him and is his dick better than mine and you know what why is she attracted to him where when he's talking about his own affair he makes very clear that it has nothing to do with the other individual and everything to do with what he's going through but he never acknowledges that his wife may be going through the exact same thing. And I really don't know where to go with this because Roth himself has a very noted pattern of minimizing women's sexuality and trivializing it and being a little flippant about it. So I don't know if this is Roth I don't know if this is a commentary on the Swedes character that he's kind of oblivious to the emotions of people around him and to his if it's a commentary on his lack of empathy I don't know if this is Zuckerberg being filtered through this and trying to make a more sensational story I don't know how to interpret this. There's so many ways to go about it. But I thought it was interesting and I thought I'd bring it up. And again, that brings us back to Zuckerberg. How much of this story can we actually trust? Because in fact, we can't trust any of it. It's all been filtered through Zuckerberg with only a few facts that we know to be true about the Swede's life. And that's kind of a commentary on fiction in general, including so there's some meta going on there. I looked up the definition of pastoral. A literary work dealing with rural life in a usually artificial manner and typically drawing a contrast between the innocence and serenity of the simple life and the misery and corruption of city and especially court life. That's politics. So we're getting that compare and contrast between the Swede and between Mary. We're getting sort of the political commentary of post-World War II America. But we're also, I think, getting a redefinition of pastoral and sort of a pessimistic view on the innocent and simple life. Anyone who's ever actually lived in a small town knows that things are not as they seem. It's very easy to project an idyllic image um, in order to fool people into thinking you've got everything together. But in reality, we all write our own fiction, including the fiction of those around us and including the fiction of what we present to others. So, having said that, this gets two stars. It is an excellent work of literature. It is a very poor reading experience and it barely qualifies as a story. So. If you're wanting an academic exercise in a literary work, pick it up. It won a Pulitzer for a reason, and Roth is an exceptional writer. If you're looking for a highbrow, well-written story, this ain't it. You're not going to be satisfied with this work. So that's all from me today. Talk to me in the comments. Have you read American Pastoral by Philip Roth? And if not, are you interested in reading it now? I would be very interested to hear your thoughts on this. And until then, bye-bye. Now, the Swede never figured out that nobody actually feels like they've got their shit together. The Swede is the guy who would look at Instagram and say, Oh, people actually look like that. And my lighting changed. And among other distinguished awards, it won the Pulitzer. It's possibly the most distinguished award. Blue Angels are in town. And a plane starts. Handmade, expertly tailored, there's a plane going overhead. Plane, plane, go away, come again another day. I think that's it.